Okay. <clears throat> so, today we're going to be talking... Uh, today we're all going to be talking, apparently. <laughs> That's... Okay. Cool. So today we're going to be talking more about fracture mechanics. Uh, I'll go into detail about um, the, the stress con critical stress concentration factor that I talked about, energy release rate, factor of, sa factor of safety, and stress concentrations around notches. Um, and I'll try to explain in a little bit more depth what each of those mean. So um, just so you all know, fracture mechanics is a tricky topic. Uh, it's difficult to wrap your head around. So um, I, I'm going to try to walk you through it all as, as best I can, but please ask questions so that I know what areas you're, you're having trouble with. So uh, yesterday, or yesterday, Wednesday, last Wednesday, uh, we had talked about what fracture mechanics is studying, the, the, the propagation of cracks in materials, um, historically how those investigations started, with first with Griffith, who studied cracks in glass, and then with Irwin, who studied cracks in ductile materials, and added the correction to the Griffith criteria. Um, to mechanics. And the big lessons we learned from there so from Griffith's studies of sharp cracks, we found that the, the stress required to nucleate a flaw, the critical stress required to nucleate a flaw, was uh, proportional to uh, 2e gamma over pi a. Or more importantly, there was this constant um, <coughs> sigma naught square root a that was a constant. So basically now the, the strength of a material here, the, or the stress required to cause failure, uh, and the, min the largest size of a flaw in a material is a constant. So then the strength of the material depends on the size of the flaws relative to the square root of A, or relative to that square root of A parameter. Um, there was the, the second criteria we showed was that Irwin criteria, which is similar. It still says uh, sigma square root A is constant, but now it says that constant is E G over A, where G I'm going to call my critical or my energy release rate. G release rate, which is the surface energy formation and the plastic energy dissipation. So here, this this two gamma is the surface energy that's formed when I split a material in half, basically. Uh, for a brittle material, it says there's some competition between strain energy, elastic strain energy, and the energy it takes to form two new surfaces. And in the notes uh, I, that I didn't post yet, but I will post sometime today, uh, I go through a little bit more depth in that derivation. Um, and so basically when it's energetically favorable, when there's too much stress on the body, it'll crack preferentially to minimize the energy in the system. Um, but that only works for brittle materials. For ductile materials, we also have to have this plastic energy dissipation. So around the tip of the crack, there's a whole bunch of plasticity. Um, but most of the time, for most fracture problems, we actually uh, want to try to minimize this term. So we make, if we make a sample that's very large relative to the size of the plastic zone, we can still use this same uh, Griffith criteria for, for analyzing fracture. And I'll show you a couple tests uh, that talk about what that means. And I'll, I'll also go into detail after this about what this uh, energy release rate is and how we actually look at it experimentally. So um, I had then shown there was some critical stress concentration or stress concentration factor, Ki. So similar to the stress concentration around a hole uh, for, the, for the stress around a hole uh, in tension where we had that factor of three uh, stress intensity, now we have very sharp cracks. So theoretically, the, the stress at an infinitely sharp crack would be infinite, but that doesn't necessarily make sense in reality. Um, really, there's some radius of curvature, but that radius of curvature is really difficult to measure experimentally. So it's, it's convenient instead to look at just the length of that crack, it's, uh, because that's something you can kind of see and measure relatively easily. Um, and so all of our fracture investigations are, are studied relative to the maximum crack size A. So here we now define a, a stress intensity factor relative to that. So here I'm going to add an extra term, uh, y sigma naught square root pi 
pi a, where I have that sigma a term. I'm going to throw a pi in there because it makes it convenient mathematically later. Uh, and then this y is a factor, is a constant, uh, depending on boundary conditions. Depending, I can spell, depending on boundary conditions. So for example, uh, a lot of the problems we look at will have a center notch crack. So we'll have some crack, uh, let's make this bigger. And, uh, we'll have a crack of width 2a in a part of width 2w. For a over w is very, very small is much less than one, then y is just one, y is a constant, but then say, so for a over w is 0 0.1, y is 1.01, but then if it was like half of the plate, so if this crack was half of the plate, 0 point, or a little bit more than half the plate, I don't know why that's the number I have, um, y is 1.3 there, so you can see it just relative the stress concentration of the uh, around the crack relative to how big it for how big it is relative to the size of the part does matter um, for an edge notch crack now so these these constants are all changed depending on which type of uh, crack you have and edge cracks are particularly bad so for a crack a plus w now uh, if I have a over w is very very small then y is still some constant, 1.12, uh, and say for a over w now is half the plate length, 0.5, y is 2.83. So it's a much more significant stress concentration factor having it at the edge of a sample versus in the center of a sample. Um, so this is why, so after, um, after the Griffith and Irwin theory started to come out, uh, and people started understanding that flaws were actually a dominant source of failure in materials. Um, you start seeing a lot of uh, parts that are made, uh, engineering parts that are made that are highly, highly polished. So especially aircraft at the time, you see the surface of airplanes is just like polished, super smooth, because they're trying to get rid of all of these surface cracks, effectively. Um, that turns out to be not necessarily as important as the internal flaws and the grain structure, but um, it was an interesting uh, interesting observation that kind of changed the way parts looked um, and it was it was to try to compensate for this fracture toughness so uh, now there's this stress concentration factor is purely geometric so it, it or it depends on the far field stress but then uh, a is a geometric parameter y is a geometric parameter uh, for actually measuring the fracture toughness of materials now I had given you this value kic KIC, which I'm going to call the fracture toughness. So I'd shown you a couple experiments. Um, yes, on Wednesday, one with uh, the silicon wafer being cleaved, and one with the hydrogel being stretched until it fractured. And so you saw that there was some at some critical load that they applied, or at some yeah some large enough load that crack kind of propagated very quickly through the material. So that was when, when the stress on the part, or when the, when the stress intensity around the crack reached that critical, that fractured toughness, uh, or critical, uh, critical stress intensity, or critical stress intensity. Stress intensity factor. So now, with that critical stress intensity, I'd given you values for a couple different materials. Um, this is now what we consider to be a material parameter, um, although testing it is sometimes challenging. But um, now we can say, when we have this, we can figure out when failure will happen in the material. Failure will happen. Uh, I still have this uh, sigma c square root a is a constant thing. Um, and now I'm going to relate that to my critical stress intensity. So I'm going to say failure happens when my, uh, so I have for uh, far field applied s 
stress sigma naught, sigma naught. This is going to happen when I hit some critical stress. Sigma naught is equal to sigma c, which is relative to my, uh, which I can define relative to my kic, kic over square root pi a. So this would be for a fixed crack size. So for a fixed max a. For, and, and this this actually is uh, the case for most materials. So for this, you, you would measure A uh, through like an ultrasonic uh, technique, through ultrasonic uh, or X-ray CT scan. So this is uh, an there's a lot of non-destructive investigation and non-destructive evaluation techniques, um, many of which uh, revolve around shooting some sort of a wave into a material and looking how that wave interacts. So ultrasonic uh, investigation, you take this little piezo ultrasonic scanner, same thing that they use for, for ultrasonic scans of your body, but now they're looking for a crack in a material. And so they scan that ultrasonic transducer around a part and they look for where uh, the look for where it bounces back differently than through the normal material. They say, oh, there's probably a crack there of a certain size. There's also x-ray computed tomography where they shoot x-rays through a material uh, and they look, they use that to reconstruct a full 3D image. Um, and I can show you, we have one of those down here in MEB uh, and you can use that to get pretty good resolution in 3D of what cracks and, uh, and uh, flaws are. The other condition for failure now uh, is when I have a, a certain fixed far field applied stress and a crack grows to a certain size. So um, this is now for, for a fixed uh, maximum crack size, uh, but I also have when A uh, is greater than or equal to some A critical, which is my uh, reorganized 1 over pi K I C over sigma not squared. This is for fixed sigma not. Uh, for example, in a, in a pressure con in a pressure vessel. So, uh, yeah. Did you say that was when A was greater than A critical? Yeah. So so if you have a crack that starts growing and the crack grows to a size greater, greater than some critical size, which we can define based on the critical stress intensity and the far field applied stress. So this would be relevant for, for a pressure vessel where you know there's just a constant stress on the pressure vessel because it's just kind of always under pressure. And then you might have some micro cracks slowly, slowly growing over time due to fatigue. Um, or for example, in an airplane. So in the airplane around the, the root of that window, when the crack at the corner of that airplane started growing and growing and growing, when it hit some critical size around that corner, then it would have propagated catastrophically through the material. And so that, that fatigue crack growth is a, is a really common failure mechanism. So I guess airplanes are also pressure vessels here. So is that supposed to say greater than or equal to? Uh, yeah, this for this one. Oh. Yes. <laughs> for both of these. Sorry. Cool. So then I have a quick hole everywhere as a sanity check for this. And then in the homework, I'll throw a couple example problems. So if I have a crack of width 2A, an internal crack, that's initially very small relative to my plate size, um, and I quadruple the size, then how much higher will the stress be uh, to cause failure? So 
I start off with a crack initially with 2A. I say there's some critical stress, sigma C, required for failure. And now I, I quadruple that crack length. What is the new critical stress required for failure relative to? Oh, double, sorry. Yes, I originally had quadruple. take, say, 30 seconds and talk about it with your neighbors. It looks like there's eh, maybe some consensus coming up. bring it back together. There's still, it looks like some disagreement between which one it might be. Who wants to get a shot and explain why they got to their answer? Yeah, and so first, uh, Let's think about it. So there, there's a root A, and so if I'm doubling it, there should be a root 2 somewhere in there. And then intuitively, if I'm making the crack bigger, would the stress required to cause failure be bigger or smaller? Smaller. Smaller. And so then here I have that square root 2 sigma, here I have that sigma C over root 2. And so if you actually plug it into those equations, you get exactly that. So then, uh, there we go. Maybe. Maybe not. There it goes. Cool. So I wrote it up here in the corner. But uh, it's all that stuff. So I have that sigma c square root a is a constant. That sigma, uh, sigma c1, sigma c2 square root 2a is also that same constant. So I can set them equal and find out the new critical stress for a bigger crack that's twice as big now is half of the, I, I need half of the stress, or 1 over square root 2 the original stress to cause failure for a crack that's twice as big now. Okay, cool. Questions, thoughts, concerns? All right, so uh, I'll give you a few in the homework, a few example problems on, on stuff related to that. And that uh, type of problem will likely be on the test. Uh, so now I want to talk real quickly about the, the energy release rate. So, so there was that other term now that uh, sigma c square root a is equal to e g over, square root of e g over a. I want to talk about what this energy release rate actually means and how we actually look at it experimentally. So let's look at the energy release rate. So I have that sigma, I'm going to reorganize this again, sigma square root pi a is equal to my critical stress intensity, 
which from the Irwin criteria is also equal to e square root of e g. Uh, and I'm going to add a star here, and I'm going to tell you what that star means later. Um, so here, this g is the rate that energy is dissipated in the fracture process. So g uh, is how fast or how, how much energy is dissipated for a given propagation of a crack. As crack grows. So the way we look at this experimentally is say I have a crack now of some width A initially, some width A initially, and then that crack starts to grow in the material to some new size. A plus some delta A um, as I as I pull on this thing. So now I'm I'm pulling on this. This would be some sort of a compact tension test. And what I'm going to look at now uh, is the load displacement response of uh, a cantilever or of this sort of a, a compact tension specimen setup. So if I now graph the applied load P on this for a given displacement small delta. Initially, I'm going to say this thing is deforming elastically. Um, this is for uh, crack A, so for A. And then if that crack grows some infinitesimal amount, delta A, uh, I'm going to have now a, a larger area. This is going to be more compliant. And so this is now for A plus delta A. So I'm going to lose some compliance. I'm going to lose some stiffness uh, or gain some compliance, lose some stiffness in the sample as that crack starts to grow. And so the way I can look at this now is for a certain P, say P naught, Initially, uh, my part would have some delta 1. After deflecting, it has some delta 2 for that same P. And I can look at the area under this curve. Uh, and I can call this now a G delta A. So I'm going to say that the, the change in energy uh, as a crack grows relates to my strain energy re release rate uh, depending on how so depending on how big that crack grows, I'm going to lose some amount of energy, and I, I'm going to measure that experimentally by unloading and loading these things and looking at the change in compliance. So you can see this done experimentally. Um, doo -doo -doo. See if it wants to go. Maybe. Let's try this again. Cool. There we go. So this is now, there's a, there's a few different ways to do fracture tests. One of the more popular ones is, is known as a compact tension test, which you add a notch into the side of a, of a small piece, add into uh, pins and you start pulling on those. So, ugh. come on, here we go. So this is a compact tension test uh, on one of those materials. So you can see now, this is a, a steel rod. There's a couple pins there in the middle. Uh, there's a clip gauge there, and they're pulling on it. And you can see now that butterfly pattern that starts to form right here at the edge. You can actually see some, some shear stress patterns forming, and you can see this crack start to grow. But what you notice as they're doing this test is they pull it up, and then they unload it slightly. So that unloading section, they're actually looking at the change in stiffness of the material 
to determine how much the crack has grown, and then they use that information about how much the crack has grown to determine how much energy has been released in the fracture process. So this is a compact tension test on a, on a steel. Cool. There's another one that I'm going to show. It's not quite as zoomed in, um, but it's... <laughs> It's not quite as zoomed in, so you can't see quite as much detail. Uh, but they take it all the way to fail. Uh, why is the why does the image look terrible on there? I don't know if that helps at all. Uh, but they're, they're pulling on it. There's still that clip gauge. This is still a compact tension test, and eventually, there it goes. So the whole thing, a, a fracture of it, propagates all the way through, and then the, the sample fails. So this is a, a fracture type test. Um, you'll be doing something much more primitive uh, in your Charpy impact tests, where so this you're, you're measuring load displacement continuously through the test. Uh, Charpy impact, you take a similar type of test, uh, which is a, a rod with a V notch in the center, and then you whack it, uh, and you see how much energy it dissipates in that whacking process. So normally you would get a, a single single stress strain point. Um, for the, the test setup, we're actually going to use, to use, we use a drop tower for it, because that's what we have here. Um, so you'll get a continuous thing, but it's still not quite as accurate as doing a compact tension or three-point bend test. So. There we go. Cool. So. This is what they're looking at experimentally now. As that crack starts to grow in the material, they look at how much the compliance or how much the stiffness has changed, and they can relate that then to the critical energy or the, to the energy release rate of the material. Um, so now this energy release rate, so now there, there's similar to there's how there's a critical fracture toughness or critical stress intensity factor. Uh, there's a critical strain energy release rate, GC. So GC which is normally related to that um, KIC, is related to that KIC, KIC squared over E, where here I, I have, I'm just reorganizing this equation, so I'm squaring KIC dividing by E. Uh, technically this is still an E star, which again I'll talk about in a second. Um, and so this, this is equivalent to the, the fracture energy of the process. So fracture energy, or um, there's there's a term called terability. Terability. So uh, I I want to make this distinction now because it, it's it's useful to help understanding these. Uh, it's, it's useful to understand the difference because it helps kind of intuitively frame fracture a little bit better. So um, now the the KIC we can say is the, the stress required to cause a crack to propagate um, uh, for a material. So this is the stress required required um, to uh, break something with a per crack. Something with a crack. But now the GC is a little bit more intuitive, actually, at least in my mind, and it's the energy released in the fracture process. Energy. That's a weird bump there. Um, so for a very stiff material, so now, now uh, you can see that this KIGC is, a, is the KIC normalized now by the stiffness of the material, essentially. So for a very stiff material uh, that's brittle, you could still have a relatively high KIC, so something like tungsten. Uh, is a relatively brittle metal, but uh, it, and it has a fairly high fracture toughness. 
because of that, a, a relatively high KIC, but there's not a lot of energy absorbed in the fracture process because it's, it's brittle. Um, whereas something like rubber, which is a very soft material, would have a KIC, to it being very soft and flexible, but uh, has a relatively high GC uh, compared to other materials. So now I'm going to show you what that is graphically. Yeah. Um, is that just breaking for GC? Is that E? Just, is that like E asterisk or like E little one? It's the it's still the Young's modulus, but there's a caveat that I'm going to talk about in a sec. Uh, and so it has to do with the plane strain or plane stress condition of the material. So now this is another Ashby plot of fracture toughness versus Young's modulus. So the KIC is on one axis, Young's modulus is on the other side. Um, you can see for strong uh, or for heavy sti or stiff materials, there's a relatively high fracture toughness of metals, nickel alloys, steels. Um, here you have technical ceramics. So uh, even though these are intrinsically brittle materials, ceramics, uh, they have a relatively high KIC something on the order of 1 to 10-ish uh, by virtue of them being very stiff, uh, whereas polymers and foams uh, and rubbers are kind of down here on the, the bottom. But uh, what you notice is now there's these ISO lines, these uh, dashed lines going down at, at a certain angle, and those ISO lines should be toughness. There we go. Toughness GC, which is KIC squared over E. So now along each of those lines, that along each of these dashed lines, that's a constant GC value. So you can see that even though for say a nickel alloy, um, or say nickel alloys are, are one of the toughest things that we have, uh, even though the fracture toughness is orders of magnitude bigger than a rubber, uh, if we actually look at say a natural rubber, um, it has a similar GC. So intuitively this is how difficult it is to tear a material apart. So this is why, um, it, I guess in my mind, say you have a, a sheet of rubber, it's really difficult to then take that rubber and break it apart because it, it, it takes a lot of energy to, to cause the fracture process to occur, even though it itself doesn't necessarily take, doesn't necessarily have a high KIC because it's very stretchy. Um, so now I'm gonna go with a couple more pull everywhere things and ask you to think about what order different materials would be for their relative KIC and their relative GC. First, the KIC. So I think this is uh, similar to the question that we asked yesterday. And now I sort of gave you the answer by showing the plot. <laughs> um, yesterday, Wednesday, similar to the thing we talked about on Wednesday. Okay, I see. take like 30 seconds to talk about it with your neighbor and try to convince them. It looks like there's still some disagreement. So keep in mind that this is the KIC, not, not the GC. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so it looks like now I might have just confused you all. Uh, who wants to explain their answer? Who wants to give their answer and say why? I think C. Uh huh. Um, you just showed us a chart. KIC and steel have height, and uh -huh. then aluminum, and then rubber. Um, it's higher than glass because it, you know, we talked about it on Wednesday. Uh, oh, that, was that was that was an ABS, yeah. So then B probably. Okay, who wants to talk about D? For somebody who chose D, there's still a lot of you. So we kind of talked about how both rubber and steel have roughly the same um, fracture toughness. Um, and we know that aluminum is generally weaker, and then glass is way down on the list in terms of strength. So, mm -hmm. kind of my thought process was uh, either steel or rubber are going to be in the first two slots, and then the third slot is definitely one of the last slot, definitely glass. So. Okay. So, let's jump back to this plot. Um, and so, now some of these are actually labeled out. So steel, we have somewhere over the top. Aluminum alloys, we have somewhere there. So steel, this is now, we're looking at KIC. So steel's way higher than aluminum. We have our, our soda lime glass there, which is that second one. And then rubber is, natural rubber, somewhere around here. So it's a little bit lower than our, our soda lime glass on average. So this is now. I know, obviously. <laughs> but this is, so, so the way now, this is, this is why I'm bringing this up, because these two are somewhat confusing concepts. Um, so the KI, these are now some materials that I had shown last week. Uh, steel has a stiffness in GPA of 200, and it has a KIC around 170. Uh, aluminum has a stiffness of 70, has a KIC around 29. Uh, glass is very weak. It's something around uh, zero point, it has a low toughness. But then natural rubber, because it has that E that's so, so small, 0 0.001, um, so like a megapascal, the KIC of rubber is actually lower than that, of natural rubber is actually lower than that of glass. Um, because it's so soft, it doesn't take a lot of force to stretch it, and therefore doesn't take a lot of force to cause a crack to propagate. But now, if we look at the GIC, so, uh, I'm gonna go through the next one. So this one now, in terms of GI, in terms of GC, which one would have the highest and which one would have the lowest? Yeah. So this is I, I in in these questions I wanted to clarify the confusion. There's there's always some confusion between fracture toughness and critical strain energy release rate KIC and GC. And so that's why I'm having these two. jump back to uh, writing these things down. Actually, do I want to jump back to? Sure. We'll jump back to writing these things down and then go back to the chart afterward. So now, actually, I may not have had those around there. Um, but <laughs> so steel, if we take our uh, stiffness uh, and our KIC, KIC now is, our G is KIC squared over E. 
uh, we can calculate the critical strain energy release rate of steel to be around 25,000, aluminum to be around 10,000, or sorry, 8,000 for 7075. Um, glass now is around one. So it's very, very low. It's a very brittle material <laughs> because it has a low fracture toughness and a high stiffness. Um, and then natural rubber is somewhere around 10,000. So I think I might have, yeah, I think technically steel would be above rubber there, but uh, I didn't, don't think I actually had that answer on there. Apologies about that. Um, and so if we look back at that plot of fracture toughness, again, these are the, the KIC versus the GC lines. So you see for a very stiff material, the KIC can be high even if it's an intrinsically brittle material. So like for a ceramic, um, because it's so stiff, it has just has a high stress required to cause fracture to propagate. But if you normalize that by your Young's modulus, you get those ISO lines, those GC lines, and you can see that our rubbers are on the same order of magnitude as steel or as metals, uh, and ceramics are, are much have a much lower KIC. I have a much lower sorry, a much lower GC than these other materials because they fall a few orders of magnitude down those ISO lines. Cool. Questions? Confusion. Uh, joules per meter squares. Yeah. And then KIC is MPA root meters. Or kilo, I guess these are kilojoules per meter squared, but same difference. Uh, I don't have enough time to talk about stress concentrations. Cool, you're gonna have to figure out what E star is tomorrow. Um, so, Sirwin, do you wanna talk a little bit about the, the labs and what you saw went well and what didn't go? Huh? Yeah, yeah. They got him back at the beginning. But we have we have about three minutes left. So I figure instead of me haphazardly going through another topic. Yeah. I'll let you take it. Do you want paper, whiteboards? I think I'll just talk. talk. Yeah. Just talk. Okay. Yeah, I'll play. Cool. About two minutes. Yeah. It's like one. So you guys finally got your laps, and I'm grading your torsion lap. Hopefully, get it done by the Thanksgiving. Um, so I think everyone did better on the torsion than the tension. So it's a nice um, buffer, <laughs> I'll say it. So for the tension lap, um, I graded like about 25, and then Santosh graded the rest of it. So I have office hour at 1 to 2 if you have further questions on how the grading was done. We do try to put as much comments, but sometimes it's difficult. Um, but we do try to put comments when you guys did something really wrong, had a completely different idea what we wanted um, you guys to write. Um, quick comments would be for the abstract. Um, a majority of you almost got it right, but the goal of an abstract is um, you try to brief the reader about the result or the key findings you get from the lab um, sufficiently that the reader doesn't have to go in further detail uh, reading the rest of the report. So one easy ex example is um, instead of saying uh, which one, which material has the higher stiffness or the order of from a higher or lower stiffness, you should men mention the values of the stiffness and then how big it is related to each other. Um, because as a reader, if you want to get the information quick without going through the details, you have to summarize the key results um, within a few um, sentences within the abstract. So for your DIC, um, when you write your DIC um, from, from a lab report, so definitely keep in mind on how can you make your abstract as concise yet 
a lot of information. Yeah. So the intro can get easily mistaken with abstract. So the intro is probably like slightly more into details about the um, experiments. So abstract probably focus more on like the results and probably kind of tell you like what uh, what kind of um, um, instrument that you use but intro goes through a little bit more into detail on how you conducted the experiments and then methods then you got into much more detail on the precautions um, for the experiment so I think most people get full points for methods because uh, essentially you're just copying from the handout with slight word, word modification um, but a lot of people did that yet they forget to put precautions so things such as like balancing the load is missing which is like the key essential step to get your experiment right so um, for, so for, for the DIC make sure when you're um, summarizing or doing um, <coughs> much concise version of the real procedure make sure you, you did not get rid of the important details to repeat the experiments um, so for results, I think results everyone did pretty good in tabulating because I felt that the templates are really helpful that most of you did not um, miss the key figures that we um, as a grader try to find but one really interesting thing is there was a few section I think uh, people did not put their true stress strain curve which I think that's because the template doesn't um, say about specifically putting a true stress strain curve to do a comparison with the engineering stress strain but uh, s there's still a good amount of people that actually puts it but but because we still require that in in the um, the actual lab manual so I, we deducted as, as little points on, on that on that end uh, it's actually a very important result to have um, so for so for your DIC make sure you have everything um, despite the, the template might uh, it's just a guide for you to put in but like you have to make sure that you're actually providing all the results based on the lab manual um, um, questions as well so that's something to keep in mind um, I think discussion uh, it, it turns out pretty decent um, uh, but several things that I want to point it out is you have all the results right you have the figure numbers you have the equations number you have the table number so that's the time in under discussion you actually referring back to the table numbers to say oh okay so we found out that the you know the stiffness from a decreasing order is from like steel to you know something and then in, in contrast you, you talk about like the modulus of toughness but the thing is when you refer to that make sure you refer to which table that shows such trend or figures or tables so definitely think about that uh, when writing f for your next formal report okay so uh, that's that's all the quick comments yeah. should I highlight everything